Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, latest edition of PIDGIP's Right to Research Speaker Series. Um, my name is Sean Flynn. I'm the director of PIDGIP, which is the program on information, justice, and intellectual property at American University's Washington College of Law. And this series is being supported by a grant uh, from Arcadia, a charitable fund founded by Elizabeth Rousing and Professor Peter Baldwin. So the arc of our discussion so far has been to survey the great diversity of research exceptions within copyright, the human rights implications um, of copyright that unduly blocks research uses, the dynamics of fair use and more flexible um, exceptions as one means to allow courts to open the reading of research exceptions to accommodate new technological uses. Last week, we had our first sessions looking at specific judicial decisions and also specific statutory norms in the EU to protect text and data mining uses and the different uses of works that are necessary to perform that function. So today we're gonna to continue that task. And we have with us today, uh, Professor Thomas Margoni to talk uh, in more detail about the, the EU, uh, what we'll call the CDSM or the Copyright and the Digital Single Market Directive and some of the implementations of that directive within the EU, um, specifically on the topic of text and data mining. And then we're gonna turn our gaze towards the global south for maybe the first direct time um, within this series and have Alan Rocha, who's a professor um, in Rio de Janeiro, speaking about a series of decisions in Brazil that have started opening exceptions to copyright, not necessarily on the subject of text and data mining, but showing an analysis that can begin to implement fundamental human rights within digital judicial decisions in that country. And both of the countries today are the groups of countries are often referred to as part of the civil law tradition. So I think a lot of us have been taught that there are meaningful and sometimes very serious differences between civil law copyright and common law copyright. And I wanna start interrogating that. You know, Part of what Alan's work does is show that even in the uh, civil law system, judges do a lot of lawmaking through their interpretation in ways that we often identify with the civil law tradition. And a lot of what Thomas, I think, will review today is the similar kinds of policy preferences and even legislative tools that are used within European civil law countries um, in this field. So by way of somewhat more formal introduction, Professor Thomas Margoni uh, will speak first. And Professor Margoni is a research professor of intellectual property law at the Faculty of Law and Criminology at KU Cluven. He's a member of the board of directors at the Center for IT and IP Law. Um, and he's, he's a, a leading uh, European scholar and leads several research teams around the topics of artificial intelligence and data protection and text and data mining, uh, most particularly to our, our interest today. Today in, uh, in my presentation, I will try to focus on uh, the role of uh, text and data mining exceptions in both civil law and common law uh, jurisdiction, especially, of course, in my case for civil law jurisdictions. And I'll do that uh, through some uh, research uh, projects and results. For example, the project that you see here right now. What I'll attempt to do is try to give you an overview of uh, what we have uh, um, observed and called as two different uh, approaches in the regulation of uh, uh, data, and in particular of non-personal data uh, and AI uh, as uh, uh, one or the main technology that relies on data and therefore to the extent to which we regulate data we regulate by proxy also ai that we found uh, uh, in uh, in the eu happening through recent uh, uh, legislative interventions and proposals we call one a property-based approach we call the other a governance-based approach 
and then I will try to discuss how these two approaches can be combined and uh, uh, how much is left uh, for your initial um, statement uh, that uh, the way in which we regulate this is influenced by our, our own uh, traditional uh, um, legal approaches. This first slide is to give you really some background about uh, the project that allowed us to conduct uh, uh, the most part of this research. We're towards the end of the project, so we started about three years ago, meaning that we wrote uh, the proposal three and a half to four years ago. And by then, uh, our main only concern, uh, at least mine, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the task that I'm covering um, was really copyright uh, and perhaps a little bit more in the field of IP, so mainly a property approach. It is only recently in the last few months that we were able to conceptualize, to, to note, to observe this other development that I will present you towards the end. Three years of work summarized in one slide is usually not uh, easy. So this is a selection of what I think uh, may be some of the most relevant elements for today's conversation. If we want to understand uh, um, how the EU, and here uh, I should make perhaps a first uh, uh, distinction. I will refer to the EU, so the European Union legal order, which is not necessarily the same as the European uh, conceived as a geographical space, but not the European Union organization. Uh, and it is all still different, even though the relationship uh, is, uh, um, is strong. Uh, to the laws of uh, European member states. In the field of copyright, probably this, uh, to European people, it's quite obvious, but to non-European people might be helpful to uh, keep in mind that uh, we don't have one EU Copyright Act. We have about 14 directives and two regulations, depending on uh, uh, how we count uh, even more, that regulates mainly vertically, so sector-specific, database uh, directives, software directive, etc. And with some few exceptions, more horizontally, so the Information Society Directive of 2001, the Corporate and Digital Single Market Directive of 2019, uh, different aspects of copyright. These are directives, so they are not directly applicable in member states. Uh, member states have to implement them into domestic law within the framework given by the directive. And uh, the framework... Traditional legal theory says that uh, leaves uh, quite a bit of space uh, to member states to implement, but the truth is that some, not all of these provisions are nowadays referred to as provision of maximum harmonization, which means that remove most, if not all, discretion from member states' intervention. Uh, good examples is Article 2 of the Information Society Directive, the right of reproduction. This is, has been defined by the Court of Justice as a norm of maximum harmonization. So there is little discretion left for member state. The same cannot be said for exceptions and limitations. Um, they may or may not be mandatory. In Article 5, they're usually not. Uh, so in the old 2001 Directive, with one exception, they are not mandatory member state can uh, uh, choose and pick. In the most recent uh, um, directive on corporate and digital single market, they tend to be uh, mandatory. Uh, but even within that framework, uh, there is some space uh, uh, left to member states uh, to decide exactly the shape. And this is a first factor that characterizes the European approach. Uh, we have a very broad uh, fully harmonized uh, right of reproduction. We have an almost unique uh, uh, European uh, form of protection for data, not all data and not data as such, but data contained in qualifying databases that even in the absence of any originality have attracted a substantial investment in the obtaining verification or creation of the uh, content of the databases then they uh, obtain a, a form of uh, property-based protection against substantial extractions. But I think that the main thing that stands out here is that uh, we have an additional layer of protection through property rights uh, of non-personal data that is almost uniquely European. And then we have exceptions and limitations, and they tend to be limited uh, in the sense that, uh, as I said, in Article 5, we have 21 exceptions and limitations. 
Member state cannot create more. They don't have to implement all of them. Only the five ones, so the exception for temporary acts of reproduction is mandatory. All the other one member states could decide whether to implement them or not, um, but they cannot create new exceptions that are not present in this closed list. Then, of course, we have some additional exceptions. Some of them can be found in the software directive, some in the database directive. More interestingly for us today for tax and data mining in article three and four of the corporate and digital single market directive. But as we will briefly see, even the way in which they are framed, and that perhaps is uh, an interesting element for the civil versus uh, common law dichotomy that you propose, Sean, uh, they are quite specific. We will see exactly how. Uh, another feature that is very peculiar of the EU, but is essential to understand uh, uh, the, the EU environment, is that EU corporate law is composed by two different elements. One is EU law, and the other is corporate law. And not necessarily they go hand in hand, if we could be so bold as to propose to grade uh, the work of the EU legislator or of the EU Court of Justice uh, in, uh, in their copyright law uh, legislative uh, act or interpretative action, um, I probably would grade it 10 out of 10 if we use this uh, parameter EU law. I think they 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 did a marvelous job in the process of uh, harmonization and uniformation. Uh, I wouldn't probably grade them uh, the same uh, uh, if we assess them not from the results on the basis of EU law, but on the results on the basis of copyright law. So the needs of copyright law seen as a discrete body of law. I obviously will abstain from uh, expressing a, a numerical value to my assessment, but uh, uh, most definitely it is not a 10 out of 10. Because uh, the way in which EU law regulates non-personal data is... Uh, um, different probably from what happens in the rest of uh, um, non-European civil, but probably also common law systems, um, we could conclude that non-personal data in the EU are protected by property rights much more than what happens in other legal systems. But really at the EU level, so at the EU level, which doesn't necessarily mean at the domestic level, we have 2.5, I say, uh, uh, corporate exceptions uh, the two tax and data mining that we will see in a second, plus the exception for uh, temporary acts of reproduction, which is still very helpful, but was designed more than 20 years ago for a very different world, which can come uh, uh, into play and can uh, um, cover acts of tax and data mining um, in the EU. Now, the other element that is important to keep in mind, uh, the way in which tax and data mining is defined under EU corporate law is so broad so broad to cover basically almost any type of dig of uh, um, uh, data analytics based on digital technologies. Almost all of them. Certainly all the field of artificial intelligence that relies on uh, machine learning and therefore on acquiring information, knowledge, uh, patterns, uh, directions from data. So this is an important element because why we call it tax and data mining, what we are really regulating to a very good extent is artificial intelligence in a way that, however, has never been declared explicit from a corporate law point of view. We have other acts that we will see in a moment uh, very briefly that are dedicated to the regulation of artificial intelligence. Article 3 or 4 are not dedicated to that. But because the way in which they were drafted is so broad, at least in terms of definition, they end up being the two exceptions on the basis of which the development of uh, AI in the EU have to comply with. And of course, this raises questions in terms of regulatory competition, meaning what does it mean for other countries uh, outside the European Union? Uh, the US with a very broad uh, fair use exception, but also the UK, which very recently uh, has issued a policy document say, well, now that we are not bound by um, Article 5 uh, 2A anymore, we could remove the restriction of non-commercial to our own tax and data mining exception and create a more attractive legal environment for high-tech companies. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, and I'm sure that we will hear more from Alan later on, what does it happen? What, uh, what happens in other legal systems that are working right now on the implementation of similar exceptions in, uh, in their own uh, legal order? Uh, Japan is another very good example, a civil law inspired tradition from the certainly from a corporate point of view, which nevertheless has implemented a quite generous tax and data mining exception. So we notice all these things and we define them as a property based approach to the regulation of data. So this last part, point number four, is uh, our ongoing research at the moment. Uh, this appears to be in tension with a new wave of legislative proposals. Nowadays, we uh, we only go by acronyms. So the DGA, Data Governance Act, DA, Data Act, AI, the Artificial Intelligence Act, the DSA and the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, Public Sector Information, Open Data Directive, Free Flow of uh, non-personal data regulations. Half of them are still in the draft phase. But all these are, you know, novel approaches to the regulation of data and uh, artificial intelligence and new technologies are to a very large extent based on a very different paradigm that doesn't rely on uh, the concept traditional to property and intellectual property, but much more to concept that we would find in various areas of public law from uh, control to portability to a, um, other uh, uh, um, aspects uh, connected to the role of intermediaries, for example. This is a first important uh, observation and partial conclusion of our work so far. Now, to give you the example of what we have uh, achieved uh, in terms of our analysis of the property-based approach to the regulation of data, in the EU, a table that we have published in one of our articles is the one that you see on your screens right now. The main point here is to realize that if the goal, and if we look at the preparatory material, one of the goals of the EU legislator was to clarify uh, the legal environment, to reduce legal barriers to innovation, to uh, reduce legal uncertainty. And this is how we can represent graphically the decision process of uh, uh, anyone, a, a, a small and medium enterprise, an individual, a journalist, a scientist, a researcher, uh, who have to determine whether they can or cannot text and data mine, uh, where the blue boxes represent the decision points, so where you have to make your own legal assessment uh, to determine whether you comply with the several conditions of the licenses, I think that uh, one uh, uh, you know, preliminary conclusion we could adopt is that, uh, well, perhaps the introduction of all these conditions connected with uh, who can benefit from the exceptions under which conditions uh, in relation to which rights, uh, in relation to which type of activities, and the relationship between the licenses and the contractual and technological measures probably leads to a situation where we could have, uh, uh, let's say, done better. We could have reduced uncertainties in a way that would uh, benefit uh, society at large uh, uh, much better. In this case, we introduce a lot of uncertainty. We introduce a lot of friction. We introduce a lot of costs connected with legal clearance, legal assessment, and risk-taking. The real danger here is that more and more people will stay away from the exception because they deem them too risky. Uh, and we have identified a series of potential behavioral patterns that will ensue from uh, such a complex legal scenario. The governance-based uh, uh, regulation of data that we have seen looks very different. Uh, it's still in the making, so I don't have really uh, um, a great deal of information. And I'm not saying that is necessarily uh, um, less complex, but perhaps is not as complicated. To give you just an idea, uh, again, um, the kind of uh, uh, legislative instruments that we mentioned are uh, th the same ones. Uh, so the one that I mentioned before through the lo that long series of acronyms, which I will not repeat, but uh, a common uh, uh, message or a common uh, denominator here seems the 
a rejection or abandon of abandonment of the traditional concepts of uh, property law in favor of uh, concepts such as access, portability, control, reusability of non-personal data in a way that uh, it has been suggested by some commentators that looks like as a sort of GDPRization of all data, not just personal data as we have uh, come uh, to know uh, them, but also the um, application of similar mechanism to non-personal data. How is this done? Um, we identify at least uh, for the time being a topology of data in the sense that uh, the European uh, uh, legislator has been looking into uh, the development of a common EU data strategy for, for a few years by now. And uh, you can see a quite coherent and, in my opinion, really interesting uh, uh, approach. We can identify different type of data from the of data, sorry, from the most open to the ones that are a bit more closed. So the most open is the high value data sets. This is a category contained in the PS in the Open Data Directive. It's the old PS uh, Public Sector Information Directive, which with the latest uh, update of 2019 is now referred to as the Open Data Directive, whereby this high value data set that will need to be identified by the Commission will be made available for free and will be made reusable across the entire EU. And one of the reasons why these are, think of data sets uh, such as uh, big statistical data sets, uh, big uh, uh, meteorological data sets, uh, usually owned by public sector bodies. Uh, and one of the reasons why there is a strong uh, uh, um, reusability role on these data sets is in the same words of the commission, because they may be extremely helpful for the development of AI technologies. In the same legislation, there is a different, more, let's say, standard type. The core of the Open Data Directive regulates uh, data and databases con uh, um, held by public sector bodies. And also in this latest uh, version uh, by certain public undertakings. And these very interestingly also apply albeit with a very specific uh, uh, provision to research data, meaning to all the data produced uh, by uh, publicly funded research, which once again introduce uh, uh, requirements of uh, uh, reusability by default. I, I will not enter into the details, but there is a main obstacle to being able to make this data reusable is when this data contain other third party intellectual property rights or uh, uh, personal data. For this case, the Data Governance Act creates another framework which will not uh, require uh, data holders to make the data available, but creates the mechanisms to incentivize the sharing of this data on a voluntary basis. And then we have the new sector of IoT data, so data uh, uh, resulting from Internet of Things, which are covered by the Data Act. And in this case, we have very specific rules on access and portability of co-created data. So if you own a smart fridge, the data contained in the fridge, we know that the data holder, so normally the manufacturer of the fridge, uh, has obligation to share data with uh, you, the data user, and even an obligation, if you desire so, to transfer those data to third parties. So that's quite interesting. We basically uh, are devising rules of portability in the case of co-generation of data. That's quite interesting. And finally, the role of technology, uh, because uh, as we said, we noticed this rejection of uh, the proprietary dimension, both in terms of intellectual property and more traditional forms of property. But, you know, uh, we still notice the presence of concepts such as control, um, access, uh, etc. And, and these concepts are not completely alien to the theory of property rights. Uh, uh, one of the main uh, justification for property rights is the ability to control the, the use and the future of a certain uh, resource. Uh, uh, it has to be defined property rights as the possibility to create an agenda for the future exploitation of property rights. So it seems that to a certain extent, uh, 
property is not just uh, completely gone, it's still there. And a risk that we have identified there is that uh, the new dress that property will wear, it's not uh, the legal one, but a technological one. So a form of substitution of uh, legal rules regulating the uh, circulation of data with technological rules. And this obviously opened the door to the question, how do we regulate technology? Because we have developed uh, rules to regulate uh, uh, rights, uh, procedures, um, but we, don't, uh, we, we haven't developed a similarly uh, a comparable body of rules that is able to regulate, for example, uh, technological protection measures, uh, uh, or other uh, technological solution that may be adopted to control data. And the way in which the European Union intends to do this, so to regulate through this mix of private and public regulatory framework, it's called European data spaces. This is still a rather new um, concept, especially for, for us as legal scholar, but is one that is uh, happening. The European Commission has already identified uh, a at least uh, uh, eight or 10 sectorial data spaces, uh, mobility, healthcare, circular economy, green deal, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as the, um, the template for what will become uh, uh, ideally a single market for data in Europe. And I think that if we want to understand uh, how the EU has approached the regulation of data uh, uh, and by whom, in the European single market, we cannot uh, understand it by looking only at the proprietary-based approach, uh, and in our case, mainly at the text and data mining exceptions. But we have to look at both uh, these uh, uh, approaches because even though they run in parallel and they risk to develop along divergent lines, uh, they focus on very similar uh, subject matter. So this is going to be, in my opinion, very exciting to observe and to study in the coming years. I borrowed this slide from um, a presentation that I have done uh, with a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Charlotte Duquang, a few weeks ago. This is how we could, uh, sorry, there is one missing, we could conceptualize, uh, at least within the Data Act and the DGA, uh, the approach to the circulation of data. You see that there are question marks. You see that there are lines uh, identifying not straightforward relationship, but it, it looks uh, much simpler than the property right representation. Now, of course, it could be uh, connected, uh, we have to be honest, to different abilities to represent graphically a uh, legal concept. That's a possibility. But certainly, there seems to be a completely different uh, paradigm in the way in which we look at uh, the governance of data from a, a data space point of view. These are more of a, of a summary of uh, what I have uh, said so far, but I will want to spend, if I can, a couple of minutes addressing then the main question that Sean asked us. So is this really a civil versus common law approach uh, that uh, can explain uh, this peculiarity that I just described to you? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, it could be that uh, uh, the tradition of droit d'auteur and of copyright put different uh, uh, emphasis on different aspects uh, of the function of copyright in modern society. We know from our studies that uh, the droit d'auteur uh, tradition is much more personally, uh, sorry, personality oriented, whereas copyright, uh, the common law, especially the US version, is much more an utilitarian kind of uh, form of regulation of uh, market dynamics. But certainly, you know, we could also look at it in a different way. We could say, okay, but what really makes things special uh, in the US uh, and in the fair use model is the use of those two words, such as that what really puts fair use apart from the civil law approach. And uh, if this is true, also from the, from the fair dealing approach, at least that adopted uh, uh, so far in the UK, the strictness uh, of the closed list of exception and limitation really uh, relies uh, probably on, on the absence of this open norm that can be uh, somehow uh, summarized with the, the two words such as. 
But perhaps uh, uh, the real uh, dichotomy between civil and common, it's better or also represented not just by a uh, uh, legal tradition in the corporate field, but by the role of courts. And, and certainly we can agree, uh, and uh, Sean will, uh, will uh, let me know if I have done my homeworks uh, uh, well enough, that, uh, that fair use uh, is originally a creation of the courts that has only been in a second moment codified by the legislature. And if we look at uh, uh, more uh, um, open interpretations of fair dealing provisions, such as in Canada, uh, a big uh, role in that uh, open interpretation has been once again by the Supreme Court. So maybe this could explain uh, the tension between civil and common law approaches. But even this uh, uh, up to a certain point, because uh, to anyone uh, familiar enough with EU corporate law, we all know that in the last 10 years, the, the real master of European, or maybe even 20, the real master of European copyright law uh, has been the European Court of Justice. Rarely we have seen uh, a Supreme Court uh, take so much uh, autonomy in the creation of uh, uh, a space for corporate law. Now, this brings us to uh, what I said at the beginning. There is a tension between corporate law and between EU law here. But uh, if you're familiar with the area, the hermeneutical tool of uh, an autonomous concept of EU law, which is the way in which uh, uh, the Court of Justice takes a concept in a directive and says, okay, this is not defined uh, as a concept that should stay with member state discretion. Therefore, it has to be interpreted autonomously and uniformly across the union is something that now we are all accustomed to it. But the first time we read it, it had a incredible power in, in new copyright law to the point where some commentators said that the court is not just active, but activist in the sense that it is making new law, a common trait of a common law court, not of a civil law one. A better way to identify the differences uh, between civil and common law, or perhaps between some civil and some common law uh, tradition may be seen in, uh, in another element connected to reality, to technology, to, to, to the economy. I refer to the law uh, and political economy approach. And just to make the example of the corporate and digital single market directive, we have to keep in mind that all publishers are based in the EU, all platforms are based in the US. And what we really try to do with Article 17, 15, and the limitations of Article 3 is to make Google pay for their use because following the rhetoric of the value gap, they were able to extract value from content of European publishers. And if this is correct, this could find a bit more support in the presence of other civil law kind of exceptions and limitations that nevertheless offer a much broader areas of exemption to the development of new technologies, such as the, the case of uh, uh, the uh, Japanese exception for tax and data mining. Let's not forget that uh, EU, uh, even after Brexit, still has an element of common law because we have at least other three EU member states that uh, follow common law tradition. So perhaps uh, all this can be explained through a, a mix of these different uh, uh, elements that certainly were certainly the uh, legal tradition plays a role, especially in the rhetoric of the courts. But there is a new wave of uh, uh, attention to the regulation of data and technology. And uh, uh, the, the interest of the different stakeholders is uh, uh, somehow uh, finds a, a very strong form of manifesting in these uh, approaches to regulations. Thank you very much.